Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody, wherever you are located. Welcome to another webinar hosted and co-organized by ANT Neuro. Um, my name is Sebastian Carstens. I'm the product manager of the Navigated TMS product portfolio at ANT Neuro. Normally, Martin Schroeder is uh, our CEO is doing the webinar. He is on vacation, so uh, I just take over. I'm actually very excited about uh, today's topic and of course also our speakers. The topic is transcranial magnetic stimulation in psychiatry and its clinical implications. Yeah, wonderful topic. The presenters today are Dr. Katikian Ganapati and Ms. Pavita Rajadran. I hope I, I pronounce the names correctly. Yeah, um, just a, a short background of our pres presenters. Um, yeah, uh, Dr. Katigian Ganapati is a consultant psychiatrist uh, at the Alberta um, Hospital in Edmonton, and he's also the medical director of the Anxiety and Mood Disorders Program and TMS Clinic at Envision Mind Care. Um, Ms. Pavita Rachid, Rachid, Rachidran is a TMS therapist and also a research coordinator at uh, Envision Mind Care as well. Yeah. Uh, thanks again um, to both speakers for accepting our invitation. Um, we are very proud to have you here. Um, thank you very much. And with this, the stage is yours. Uh, thank you, Sebastian, for introducing us. And um, so we'll get started. So we're going to be presenting to you about transcranial magnetic stimulation. So some of the basic principles in TMS is it's Based on the law of electromagnetic induction discovered by Michael Faraday in 1838. So according to that law, if a pulse of electric current passes through a coil and it's placed over subject's head, it generates a rapidly changing magnetic pulse that penetrates the skull and the scalp and it to reach the cortex. So this pulse of magnetic field induces a secondary ionic current in the brain and that induced electric pulse in the brain, it can trigger an axon potential in the cortical neurons especially in like superficial parts of the cerebral cortex and thus stimulating the brain. So unlike ECT, where there's resistance because of the electrical pulses in the electrical field, uh, in TMS, because we use magnetic fields, you'll feel no resistance in, because of the scalp or the skull. So this principle is used for um, determining your MT, the single pulse TMS. So when TMS is applied to your motor cortex at, at an approximate stimulation intensity, uh, motor evoked potential can be recorded from your contralateral extremity muscle. So the motor threshold refers to the lowest TMS intensity necessary to evoke an MEP in the target muscle when single pulse stimuli are applied to the motor cortex. And the motor threshold is believed to reflect membrane excitability of corticospinal neurons and the interneurons projecting onto these neurons in the motor cortex, as well as the excitability of the motor neurons in the spinal cord, the neuromuscular junctions, and the muscles. So as you can see in this animation, we are hoping to see a strong switch in a, the right thumb of a patient to determine the MT when you're treating um, areas such as the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, but if you want to target deeper structures such as the dorsal medial prefrontal cortex or the anterior cingulate cortex or your orbital frontal cortex, we have to see for a twitch in your toes so that you know it's uh, targeting the deeper structures. And the second principle is uh, the TMS, like repetitive TMS creates either a high frequency or a low frequency we can use to either dampen or inhibit, um, sorry, dampen or excite your neurons. So if low frequency RTMS is used, uh, you can, it, it, it decreases the cortical excitability and it has an inhibitory effect. And as you can see in the animation, if a patient's very anxious, uh, their neurons are firing very fast. So with using the low frequency, you can dampen the neuron and create a long-term depression and it can help them calm down. Whereas the high frequency, it, you can, it's the um, neural activity is very increased. So you can have a, sorry, you can increase the neural excitability by stimulating, have a stimulatory effect. Um, and the third principle is most of the TMS treatments is circuit based and not diagnosis based. So you're treating the circuit and the symptoms. And whereas uh, the pharmacotherapy, you're, it's 
you're targeting the molecules and the genes. And for the psychotherapy, you're targeting the behavior. And the TMS works mostly on your circuits. So all three work together. And TMS is very complementary to the pharmacological and the psychosocial interventions. And if they're all three are used together, it works best. But TMS can also be very effective by itself. Thank you, Pavitra. Well, um, um, thank you very much for the kind introduction. Uh, you basically heard about the um, basic principles of, of uh, TMS, and um, we wanted to stretch that, you know, um, uh, uh, the importance of those principles because I'm going to kind of explain about um, the protocols, what we're trying to use, and and um, and also trying to highlight some of the kind of you know latest evidences for some of the kind of psychiatric conditions most commonly we are treating. Uh, I've just highlighted the four conditions here. Of course, we treat other conditions as well. I'm more than happy to kind of you know um, um, explain further if we have time. Um, first of all, the, the bread and butter of what we do is is mostly depression and anxiety in our anxiety and mood disorders clinic. Um, let me you know um, um, explain a little bit about uh, the depression. Um, so here, the understanding is very clearly that um, the limbic system is uh, quite underactive, actually. And therefore, we tend to use high frequency pulses to activate the circuit. Uh, this has been clearly demonstrated um, in, um, you know, scans as well. I'm just going to go a little bit, so yeah, I just want to kind of show this scan to highlight that. Um, so functional MRI scans have actually demonstrated this very clearly. In patients with depression, you could actually kind of see there's a lot of areas which are quite, quite un, you know, underactive. And um, if you're going to activate them by targeting the um, dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, they actually have connections all the way to the limbic system, actually. And when you do do that, it actually becomes quite activated. So um, Pavitra was highlighting about the, um, the circuits. So we're talking about the default mode networks, you know, the salience executive control networks. Um, so these are the kind of, you know, uh, uh, the, some of the basic networks we are trying to target here. And, um, and you can clearly see that how TMS is actually going to be quite effective in these patients um, when you do kind of use um, high frequency pulses. So I'm just going to go back to the slide what I was trying to highlight before. This is a principle in depression. And um, we tend to follow um, CANMAT guidelines. CANMAT is actually the Canadian Network for Mood and Anxiety Treatment Disorders. And um, they have actually, um, you know, have a separate section. There's going to be an updated version that is going to come up. This is 2016. 2021 is going to kind of come up very soon. And uh, interestingly, they have shown that increasing evidence for efficacy, tolerability, and safety of neurostimulation treatments is being demonstrated. And RTMS is now a first line recommendation. So um, uh, that, is, that is the conclusion actually that came out of this um, uh, study. And uh, we are recommending RTMS now far ahead of uh, ECT. So if somebody has failed um, you know, one or two antidepressants and they're looking at further treatment options along with psychological therapies or so, TMS is certainly something we would actually recommend. Uh, ECT has now a second line neurostimulation treatment. Of course, you know, in those inpatient situations where people are not eating, not drinking, and who are very severely unwell, we continue to consider ECT as a first line treatment. Some of the TMS protocols, what we tend to use here is uh, basically this. Um, we try to, um, uh, use the most common protocol is the left dorsolateral prefrontal cortex high frequency stimulation. And you're looking at high frequency means something more than 10 hertz. Um, so we have noticed almost 60 to 70 percentage of our patients do respond to this particular protocol. If they do not respond, then we try to kind of move on to other protocols. The commonly used other protocols is the dorsal medial prefrontal cortex. Um, we have uh, not tried much of the orbitofrontal cortex, but they do kind of respond in 10% in of the people, actually. This is basically based on the study that has been demonstrated by uh, Dr. Jonathan Towner. He's based at Toronto, and uh, some of his uh, seminal papers are very, very helpful in guiding us about the treatment. In the future, we do believe that functional MRIs could be playing a huge role 
as of now, what we would recommend is rather than relying on something like, you know, those investigations, which would involve cost, time and everything, we might be able to quickly just follow the protocol of one for most of the patients. And if they don't respond, you go on to the protocol two. And, uh, and if they do not respond again, you go to protocol three. I highlighted about this before and we talked about it. And, um, and this is basically a patient who has been depressed and then after TMS, they are responding very well to that. Now, I'd like to move on to the anxiety uh, protocols here. And um, in anxiety, as I elaborated earlier, the, the, you know, we are trying to again target the circuits here. And our understanding here in anxiety disorders is that uh, the circuits are probably kind of more hyperactive and therefore it's best to uh, you know, inhibit them and, uh, and trying to dampen them using LTD or long-term depression is, is, basic, is basically best done by using low frequency at right dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. We do tend to use um, the bilateral protocol in quite a lot of patients who actually has a mixture of anxiety and depression symptoms. So uh, Pavitra was quite nicely highlighting about the fact that we are trying to do it very much symptom-based. It is not a diagnosis-based treatment. TMS is very much a symptom-based treatment. So you have to look at the clinical presentation of the patients. And if they do actually have both the symptoms, then I would recommend going more down the route of using bilateral protocol. And we have developed some good clinical expertise of uh, treating our patients. So far, um, I believe we have treated around um, 170 plus patients at least. We have probably done more than you know, 8,000 sessions now. And, um, uh, and our expertise is that when patients come in with a lot of anxiety, it is best to start with the low frequency protocol. And um, once they feel a little bit more calmer and relaxed, we do tend to add the high frequency protocol you know, after that. And we do tend to use it as a bilateral actually. This is just to kind of elaborate about a particular case study for a patient who has come into us. This is some of the common presentations. They do actually have both major depression, generalized anxiety, social anxiety. We really often ask them to um, self-rate their depression and anxiety using Bex depression and Bex anxiety inventory. They do that on a weekly basis, and this helps us to monitor the progress of the symptoms. So. In this patient, you could see that the patient actually has both depression and anxiety scores. They started at 28 on the Bex depression inventory, and we do the treatment five days a week for six weeks. Saturdays and Sundays are a bit of a break for us. And um, uh, this, is, this is a standard protocol we tend to follow. We would like to see at least a 50% reduction in the symptoms during that time period. So, this patient has quite nicely responded um, all the way coming from 28 to six by the end of uh, 26 sessions actually. And here, Bix Anxiety Inventory has also kind of quite nicely docked in. It's come down and um, the probably, you know, sometimes we do notice an increase in anxiety when the patients you know, are, are finishing their treatment. This patient has responded quite well by the middle of the treatment and there is a slight increase in, in um, Moving on to the next patient. Uh, this is a patient with bipolar depression, uh, patient presented with a lot of depression and anxiety symptoms. We had actually started this patient on a high frequency. Um, um, and interestingly, we have noticed a significant improvement in their depression and anxiety scores actually uh, in this patient. Is there a case for considering adding it as a bilateral protocol? Absolutely you know, we could always use the high frequency and the low frequency, which means like using 10 hertz on the left dorsolateral prefrontal cortex and one hertz on the right dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. These are some of the common protocols we tend to do using the machines. We actually have both the Mac Pro, uh, which is done by the Mac Venture machine, and we also have the brain space uh, deep TMS treatment. So, um, uh, we do tend to use um, uh, the MagVenture machine if you're trying to do the separate protocols. Um, so here we could actually see that these are some of the 
common protocols what we use and and um, if you're looking at targeting the um, left-sided dorsolateral prefrontal cortex we use the 10 hertz protocol and uh, most commonly is around 75 trains 40 pulses per train uh, and therefore you're looking at around 3000 pulses in total actually the intervals that has been commonly said is around 26 actually we have considered you know we have reduced it to 19 in some patients even to um, 15 to reduce the amount of time the patient has to um, it lie down on the chair and uh, and that is called as a little bit of accelerated protocol we do finish the treatments uh, usually in 15 to 20 minutes if you tend to reduce the interval between the pulses we have actually tried using the um, theta burst protocol as well these are the three minutes protocols which has become quite um, um, popular in some patients and uh, i have to say that um, the regular protocols are a lot more easily tolerated than the theta burst protocols. Uh, having said that, the theta burst protocols advantage is the time. And um, we do use this, the intermittent theta burst protocol, which actually has um, a stimulatory effect. And the continuous theta burst protocol actually has an inhibitory effect. And we tend to use the CTBS for the continuous theta burst in patients with anxiety and the intermittent theta burst, which is a stimulatory effect in patients with depression. Moving on to um, OCD, um, this is a, 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 a situation where we have actually had uh, developed quite a bit of expertise in the past one year. Uh, we have been fortunate enough to have access to the brain space uh, deep TMS coil H7, which um, targets the um, dorsal medial prefrontal cortex and the anterior cingulate cortex in particular. Interestingly, here, what we do know in OCD patients is that the, um, the cortical striatothalamic tract, there is a bit of an overactivity in this patients in, in OCD. And when the studies was conducted using one hertz protocol and the 20 hertz protocol, what they were able to demonstrate is that the 20 hertz protocol paradoxically showed a better response than the one hertz protocol. And therefore, they recommended using the high frequency. And that is how uh, this has become quite popular. So um, there has been various hypotheses of why this could be, uh, but um, you know, uh, uh, you know, there's nothing has been conclusively proven, um, but we do know it works. And we tend to use these high frequency protocols using the uh, uh, 20 Hertz, actually. This is the particular coil we use used by Brainsway, and this is the H7 coils. And um, this is the study that demonstrated actually a significant reduction in the symptoms. And um, uh, the response rate where actually patients have more than 30% reduction in the Y box was almost around 38% um, of the patients responded. But if you could look at the sham treatment, only 11% responded. If you look at a partial response, of just less than you know 20% uh, reduction in the symptoms, uh, um, then sorry, more than 20% reduction in symptoms, then you're looking at more than 50% of the patients with OCD responding to it, whereas the placebo, you're only looking at around 26 actually. Remember, in OCD, it's a very difficult to treat population, and uh, they are extremely pleased with uh, any significant reduction and one third reduction is, is a major you know, reduction in the symptomatology and the improvement in the quality of life. So this is the protocol we tend to use. Uh, it's a 20 hertz uh, stimulation. We use it for two seconds, 40 pulses per uh, train, and we do have a wait time of around 20 seconds. Uh, and the total number of pulses that's given is around 2000. Now, MagVenture has actually received the FDA clearance for OCD, and uh, they are trying to target the um, anterior cingulate as well by uh, positioning using this DB80 coil. And um, uh, we have, have actually treated um, you know, one patient with that so far, and, um, and the results are reasonably encouraging. Uh, predominantly, we tend to use only brain spray machine for the OCD treatment, but this is certainly an option as well. 
Uh, unfortunately, Health Canada has still not yet approved it. I believe the company is in the process of doing it. After getting full approval, uh, that's when we are going to kind of probably use it more actively. But um, as of now, you know, uh, the DB80 coil itself is being approved for treatment for depression, and therefore we are still allowed to use it in in um, in Canada. So this is a patient uh, where you know uh, who presented. Uh, a 41 years old male with uh, severe OCD and usually lasting for more than 10 years, uh, came in with a, a Y box scale of 35 out of 40, uh, very severely unwell. And um, we had actually used um, the deep TMS um, using the high frequency protocol. And um, we have done sometimes, you know, I mean, the usual recommended treatment is um, uh, at least five days a week for six to eight weeks, around 40 sessions. Um, and uh, what they have recommended is that if you do actually see a good significant response by 30 sessions, then they recommend you to kind of carry on um, treating actually. And in OCD, what you mean by significant response is one third reduction in symptoms. We are not looking at 50 percentage or, or one half of the reduction in symptoms as in depression, but one third is good enough. And uh, here, for this patient, he had actually traveled all the way, you know, um, um, for almost five hours, and he was staying in, in Edmonton. And hence, we actually tried to um, do almost uh, two sessions per day, one in the morning and one in the evening. And um, we had actually done around 45 sessions for these patients as well. Uh, he went on to receive a, a lot more treatment than this. Um, I think we, we had actually kind of done almost around 60 sessions actually by the time he left. And um, I would like to highlight about this, uh, another condition, PTSD, which is a post-traumatic stress disorder. We have actually have a lot of uh, patients who have been referred by the veteran FS, and they do come in for treatment for the PTSD. Uh, as you would normally know, uh, there are a lot of um, patients with PTSD who actually have depression as well. And um, when they do kind of come in here for treatment, we try to target the right dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. We tend to use the um, anxiety protocol using the one hertz um, you know, dampening effect, but very often we have expertise of using it as a bilateral protocol, which means like we tend to use both the one hertz on the right dorsolateral prefrontal cortex and also the 10 hertz on the left dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. By doing that, we actually see a reduction in both the depression symptoms and as well as in the PTSD symptoms as well. Now, uh, there has been review articles coming up with actually kind of you know, well, um, emphasizing the benefits of uh, targeting the right dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. Interestingly, if you look at this particular review article, it has actually suggested that we can probably use um, the low frequency or even the high frequency at the right dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. We have not used much of the high frequency on the right dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, but that seems to be an option available as well. Um, that's uh, everything for all the kind of, you know, um, um, the, the four conditions which I would like to talk about. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm more than happy to uh, answer any specific questions you have. Uh, there's a lot more I can elaborate on what are the other different conditions we tend to use it in as well. Happy to share some of my thoughts on that. But these are probably the, the most common conditions, you know, um, uh, we tend to use it here in the anxiety and mood disorders clinic in Envision Mind Care. Thank you.